Okay, welcome, welcome to First Assembly of B224. We're so glad that you have joined us today. Uh, we're going to continue our series uh, that we're calling Us. And so I'm really excited to get to share with you uh, what we started a few weeks ago with Pastor Allen, and he talked about joining us. What does that look like to join us, to be a part of a community, to be a part of a body of believers? And so we talked about what that looked like in the faith and all of that. And so then we continued, and um, Pastor Sean and Pastor Danny continued and talked about what does it look like to live a part of us? to be a part of our community, to live as a, a, a unified body. And so we're going to continue today talking about what it looks like to teach us. And so as maybe you've been in a situation where uh, you've seen, you've heard, maybe you've heard the saying, um, oh man, what's the saying? Maybe you've heard the saying, do as I say, not as I do. That's something my mom used to always say to me. Do as I say, but not as I do. Maybe you've seen something modeled before you, and uh, it's something that you're like, well, I probably shouldn't do that, but that's what you end up doing. I think that happens to us a lot of times. And so uh, this is a, a message talking about when we're taught. So what is taught to us? What example are we living out? So when we are taught, then we are now called to teach. And so we're called to teach the younger generations and the people around us and the uh, people in our community. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, teach us. And so we're going to go to Titus 2. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Titus 2, we're continuing in the book of Titus, verses 1 through 8. Titus 2, verses 1 through 8. It says this, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love and in steadfastness. Older women are likewise to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may be revealed. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you've given us this opportunity to hear your word. And God, we pray that you would just instill this in our hearts, that you would... Uh, teach us what it looks like to live in community with other people. Teach us what it looks like to be an example of who you, who you have been in our lives and who you are in other people's lives. God, I just pray a blessing over this time, Lord, that you would begin to speak to us. Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would be evident in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, like I said, how many of you have ever been in a situation where maybe what you've done was not modeled, was not what you were supposed to do, but it was what you were modeled to do? Have any of you ever been in one of those situations? Well, my mom, uh, she was always the one uh, to be very, how can I say this? She was always the one to expect a lot from us when it came to different situations. So. We grew up doing kind of like role play. Like I remember my dad would uh, walk us alongside the pool when we were really little and learning how to swim. And um, we'd be walking and then he would uh, he'd say all of a sudden like one, two, three, and we'd have to like fall in the pool. So it'd be kind of like a role play of what happened if you fell in the pool and uh, you didn't know how to swim. So you swim to the side really fast and all that sort of thing. So we had little examples like that. We'd do little role plays. My mom would give us different opportunities to try out what would happen if this happened. So like kind of like in school you do a fire drill. What would you do if a fire happened? I feel like school kind of does that for us. We uh, learn a lot of what to do in different situations. And so there was this one time that my mom and dad and me and my sisters, we were in the car and we were driving. It was somewhere in the Midwest. We were driving and there was a supposed supposed to be this big storm, but we uh, were on our way to a new lo new location. My family was traveling. And so we were like, well, we're not going to listen to, they told us that we probably shouldn't be on the road in the Midwest, lots of storms, lots of tornadoes, things like that, that really aren't that great. And so um, 
we were in the car and we were driving and I remember uh, all of a sudden the skies got really green and it looked like there may be a tornado coming. Me and my sister start crying in the back seat because we're like, we're not supposed to be on the road. The news said it, we knew it, but my dad was like, no, we have to get to where we need to be. So we're in the car, we're driving, and even then I was like, uh, me and my sisters were asking my dad, we're like, dad, we need to stop, we need to stop under a bridge, which is where you're supposed to go if there's like a tornado, you're supposed to like go way under the bridge. Uh, so we're like, we need to stop, we need to stop, and I was like, oh no, we're going to be just fine, you're totally good, we've, we've been a part of like bad thunderstorms before, like it's going to be all good. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it starts getting crazy outside, there's hail, there's storms, or not storms, but there's thunder, it just, it is crazy, it looks like it is about to, all of heaven is going to break loose and uh, there's going to be the worst storm you've ever seen. So me and my sisters, like I said, we're crying. We don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, my dad and my mom, well, my mom the whole time has been leaning back in the backseat. Girls, calm down. Girls, calm down. It's okay. You're fine. Calm down. Be calm. Hey, don't make this situation any more than it needs to be. So we're all freaking out. All of a sudden, my dad pulls over our car, jumps out, opens the back, the back door of the car, and he says, get out of the car, we gotta go in the ditch. <laughs> so we like jump out of the car, run in the ditch. My mom is freaking out. So all the times that she'd been saying, girls, be calm, girls. <laughs> in the middle of an emergency, the last thing we need is for you to be crying. The last thing we need is for you to be screaming. My mom is laying in the ditch, crying, <laughs> yelling at my dad for not uh, pulling over sooner. It was just a crazy situation. There ended up not being a tornado, and we <laughs> sat in the ditch for a good 30 minutes, uh, probably for no reason, but it was okay. But so it was like one of those situations where my mom had been so, so, so apparent, saying, girls, you need to be calm. In the middle of, this, of an emergency, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be calm. And it was in the middle of the situation that my mom modeled something the opposite of what she was saying. Hmm. And uh, I also think there was another time, it was my freshman year here, uh, I was, uh, it was spring break, there was no one on campus, and I was here, a few of my friends decided to stay, and so uh, before, there wasn't, there, many people weren't here, and so we had already um, kind of done a bunch of different stuff, and uh, me and a few friends were staying on campus, and so then uh, as we were staying here, I was in my room, it was really, it was like three in the morning, obviously, I was asleep. All of a sudden, the middle of the night, uh, my roommate didn't come back that night, which, come to find out later, she ended up staying in a different friend's room that night. So I was already kind of freaking out, I was like, I wonder why she's not here. So, uh, as I'm sleeping, all of a sudden, the fire alarm goes off. And so I wake up, and I'm thinking, man, there's no one here. I wonder why the fire alarm is going off. But how many times have we done fire drills in school? Probably once a month, right? Back in high school, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go out of the building, don't grab anything, uh, do whatever you got to do to get out. Well, I'm laying in my bed, the fire alarm is going off, and I'm thinking through my head, I know what I should do but I don't know what I should do. So I laid in bed for a good five minutes and I just contemplated, I was like, should I leave? Should I like grab my stuff and like get out of the room and get out of the building? Or should I like wait it out? I had no idea what to do in that moment. And so long story short, I ended up going out of my room. There was nobody, I heard people, there was nobody there. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. But uh, just like in all of our lives, we've had moments where what we have learned to do doesn't come out in our actions. And so uh, when we go to Titus, this part of Titus, I think that there are four facets of this scripture that I want to dig deep into. I know we read it really fast, uh, and there's a lot of information. So we're going to go just right into each one of these verses. There are four spots that I want to go to that it doesn't matter uh, if you're young in age or if you're young uh, at heart, either one of those, any, wherever you are on the spectrum, you can find yourself identified in this passage because Titus uh, is very, he, or Paul, who wrote this to Titus, wrote this, and he divided it up between four different things. So he divided uh, the specific roles of these church members into four different areas. So he talked to the older men, he talked to the older women, then he talked to the younger women, 
Then he talked to the younger men. So all of us can probably identify ourselves in one of those things. And he basically, Paul wrote this and was saying, this is how you're supposed to live. And so what's kind of interesting is that when we start it, the first verse, so verse uh, 1 says, But as for you, teach what, accord, what accords with sound doctrine. So Paul's telling Titus, this is what you're supposed to teach in order to, to maintain a healthy doctrine of life. Sound, in the Greek, if you go back to it, it's the same word for healthy and balanced. Uh, and so we're supposed to live in a balanced, healthy doctrine. And so that's what all of these different uh, facets of the scripture are supposed to be. So older men, older women, younger women, younger men are all, what does it look like to live balanced? And this isn't just what is right and wrong, and so it's not a list of rule books for Christianity. And I thought that was so interesting as I was researching this, uh, all the different things that were talking about it, because it keeps saying, teach what is good. It doesn't necessarily say, teach what is right. Uh, it doesn't say, don't teach what is wrong, but it teach what is good. And so this isn't a list of rules. It's not a list of of um, things that if you do this, uh, you're not a Christian anymore. If you do this, uh, you like are a Christian, that sort of thing. But this is a list of guidelines of how we can live a balanced, healthy life in Christ. And so I want to go over what that looks like. And so the first facet that I want to talk about in the scripture is older men. So older men, it says, older men are to be sober-minded, to be dignified, to be self-controlled, Sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. That same word sound is in there again, and it's the same word for healthy. So what does that look like to be healthy in faith, healthy in love, and healthy in steadfastness? For older men uh, to be dignified. This, the way that Paul writes this is that this word teach is literally teaching, not just teaching a concept, but teaching to be. So you're not teaching the concept of being sober-minded. You're teaching to be sober-minded. What does that look like in our everyday life and everything that we do to be sober-minded, to be dignified? And then we go on, and when it talks to older women, to, uh, it says, likewise, they are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. I thought this was really interesting when I was researching a little bit more of what this looks like. And uh, the way that Paul splits this up between gender and age and uh, all of that here, we see that a lot of times we look at Christianity and we see that there still is a big divide between men and women and equality. And then even throughout history, there's been such a divide between this. But Christianity was actually one of the first movements in, in history of women being empowered to live beyond their status quo, beyond their level of what they've normally lived. So the Christian era, the early church era, was actually the beginning of the push for women to be able to live uh, in more ways than they thought that they were going to be able to, which is such a cool part of this story. And so what we have to remember is that even though that there was this beginning push, uh, it's also, um, yeah, so even though it, we have this beginning push in the beginning, it takes time to develop that. It's a seed that was planted, and so it didn't take 10 minutes for all of a sudden there to be equality, and it, it didn't even take 10 years for all of a sudden to be equality. That's something we're still working on, but it's a seed that can be planted. And so older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. This is... A, this is kind of a topic that we talk about a lot in churches. Men, is it okay to drink? What is alcohol? What is alcohol's role in the church? And so this is uh, in Titus, in what Paul is saying, this is a guideline uh, for us to live dignified and to live life to the fullest. Does that mean uh, absolute, like, absolutely do not drink alcohol? No. Is that a rule? No. But to not be a slave to wine, to not be a slanderer. Uh, that is so important in order for us to really live a life that God has called us to. We're not to be slaves to anything, anything that could cloud our judgment. We're supposed to be, uh, later on we talk, I think in Titus, that talk about like being a bondservant of Christ, to be a slave to Christ, but not to the things of this world. Uh, 
when we talk about, when uh, Paul talks about women in this as well, so this, he talks from the older men, then he talks to the old, older women, and in the older women, he says that they are to set the example for the younger women. So this is the first time we see this idea of an example being set. And so the older women are to set an example, uh, to be self-controlled, to work at home, and to be submissive to their own husbands. This, again, with the equality thing, this is one of the biggest topics in Christianity, even today, when we look at what it looks like to be submissive to a husband, uh, to, love your fam to love your family. And I think what's really cool in this is that this is a guideline that Paul gave us in order to live for Christ. And what it is, is that it's simply showing that God cares about our family. He cares about the relationship that we have with our kids. He cares about the relationship that we have with our spouses. Family is important, and so for the older generation to be able to set the example for the younger generation, it goes so much further than uh, just living it out, but actually being able, since they've been taught, now they are able to teach to the younger generation. And then with that, the younger women, it kind of goes right along with that. The younger women are to... Uh, submit to their husbands. They are to be uh, to be self-controlled, to be pure, so that God may be revealed. And I love that. And I think that's the purpose of why we are taught. We are taught the guidelines and what we are to do. And it is so that the glory of God may be revealed in what we have, in what we are doing. And so the last facets we have, the first facet, older men. Same. It's the same kind of idea that Paul talked about in Timothy and in the different passages about deacons. Uh, men are supposed to be dignified and worthy of respect, sound in faith, healthy, living balanced lives. Older women, same thing, to be reverent, to be uh, to not be slaves too much wine. Same thing for the younger women. So we're up to three younger women, to be self-controlled, to be pure, to be working at home, um, to be kind. And then we go to the, uh, the last facet of the scripture. The young, uh, it says, then likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. I think it's so interesting that that is really the only thing it says to the younger men. Because it kind of lists all the other things that we're supposed to be. But for the young men, to be self-controlled. And I don't know if you noticed this, but if you read through all of these different people, the one thing that sticks out, the one thing that repeats in every single, so all the different in the body of Christ, there are so many different roles, and yet, and so many different specific characteristics, and yet all of them have the same thing in it, to be self-controlled. So the unifying factor in there is to be self-controlled. What does that look like in our lives, to be self-controlled? Because before uh, you, can, you can join us, and as you join us, and before we can really be a healthy, balanced, balanced us, you have to be a healthy, balanced you. Yeah. And so in this congregation and in uh, the body of Christ, I just encourage you, before you begin to add in your gifts, make sure that you are balancing your life. Make sure that your spirit is balanced, that you, uh, that you are living healthy, that you're living self-controlled, that you're living dignified, that you're living worthy of respect. And uh, in order for for the kingdom of God to really advance the way that we believe that it will, we have to live in a way that uh, doesn't just um, doesn't just go along with what everybody else does. I think that's that's the thing to set an example. And in the last bit of the verse, it says, "Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech." Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. The goal of, of what we are doing is to be an example to the people around us. So in the unity of the body of Christ, you are important and how you live is important. So not just the us as a whole, it's who you are uh, that, that really matters and that's what's going to draw people to who Christ is. And I mean, if you think about it, um, we can invite people through flyers, through media. We can have the best place in the world. We can use the coolest videos. We can use uh, the. We can be the most culturally relevant church. But really, it comes down to when we're inviting people to come, or when we're uh, trying to advance the gospel. It comes down to you. 
It comes down to the life that you've lived that has been the example for those coming in. And so...